Thank you, Marla. And let me just say that whoever you are and wherever you may be on your life's journey, you are welcome here at the, ha at the oh my gosh, sorry, at the Sunderland Congregational Church, part of the United Church of Christ. Uh, between today's readings and the liturgy and the prayers, uh, we're going to be talking about community and how essential this is. It's not it's not obligation. This, this is really a blessing, and I just wish that we would appreciate that blessing more of community. Uh, so where I live, um, last night across the street, they had this gigantic party. They got a, a big farm over there, and they set up a tent. They had smokers, and, and they had a live band. They had a car show, uh, and they were going, I think, I last heard them around, somewhere around 11 o'clock, but they were having a wonderful time. They, they came together, and they enjoyed each other's company for no reason. They just liked being together. My neighborhood is having a neighborhood block party this afternoon. And that idea of just coming together, there is worth in that. People find a lot of, of, of strength in that. Uh, I don't know about you, but this morning when I was trying to head to Hatfield, that's when in, in like hundreds of people were that, that treehouse um, half marathon, hundreds of people running by. And you know, they're out there torturing themselves, running 13 some odd miles. But you know, there's a community and they feel stronger by that community supporting one another. And so I think when you hear today's gospel, when you hear today's prayers, think about the power that is the community of the church. Uh, this is not something to be endured. This is something to uplift. And I, I hope we can feel that. I hope we can share that message um, that church in this community is something to cherish. And so with all of that said, our opening hymn and candle lighting this morning is from Red Hymn number 391, Be Thou My Vision. now turn to our bulletins for the call to worship. May our time together draw us away from the complacency of an unexamined faith. We are called by God to listen and learn. We are today's disciples of Christ, the followers of Jesus. How will we answer Jesus' question, of who do you say that I am? When our expectations of faith are challenged, may we rely on the relationship with Christ that we nurture now as church.
And now coming together is this congregation here in person, those via Zoom and later those via FCAT, our unison prayer. God of wisdom and knowledge, inspiration and insight, we trust that you are in our presence. We offer prayers of invocation, asking that we may become more fully aware of you in this sacred hour. Make your word known to us, stretch out your hand to touch us, and expand our willingness to explore the meaning of our faith. Draw us away from our own devices so that we may truly be open to your continuing revelation. Strengthen our spiritual convictions so that in moments of confusion or doubt, we may rely on the relationship we are building with you at this very moment. Be powerfully present so that any hesitation may fade away and we may celebrate the blessings that surround us Amen. James verses 1 through 12. Not many of you should become teachers, my brothers and sisters, for you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness. For all of us make many mistakes. Anyone who makes no mistakes in speaking is perfect, able to keep the whole body in check with a bridle. If we put bits into the mouths of horses to make them obey us, we guide their whole bodies. Or look at ships, though they are so large that it takes strong winds to drive them, yet they are guided by a very small rudder whenever the will of the pilot directs. So also the tongue is a small member, yet it boasts of great exploits. How great a forest is set ablaze by a small fire. And the tongue is a fire. The tongue is placed among our members as a world of inequity. It stains the whole body, sets a fire the cycle of nature, and it itself set a fire by hell. For every species of beast and bird, of reptile and sea creature, can be tamed and has been tamed by the human species. But no one can tame the tongue, a restless evil full of deadly poison. With it, we bless the Lord and Father, and with it, we curse those who are made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come blessing and cursing. My brothers and sisters, this ought not be so. Does a spring pour forth the same opening, both fresh and brackish water? Can a fig tree, my brothers and sisters, yield olives or grapevine figs? No more can salt water yield fresh. You did really well. <laughs> All right. So I got a buddy finally. Yeah, I've always seen Sakura go to somebody else. Now she finally came to me. It's a big day for me. Yeah. So you found my book, huh? Adam and Eve? Yeah. Yeah, that's Eve. That's Adam. Yeah, that looks like a pair. So this is a perfect time you came up because we're going to be talking about the kids today. Do you see this? I do see that. Do you see that, the, the snake? Yeah, pretty cool. You know what I want to talk about, though? I'm, just hang out right there, stay right there. You see these beautiful flowers? So Mrs. Grace brought these flowers to church to honor her parents, but also to honor God. And see how pretty they are? Aren't they gorgeous? And so when you give a gift to God, like Mrs. Graves gave this gift to God today, you want to offer the best you possibly can. You know, if this was a bunch of weeds that were all wilted and brown and mushy and yucky looking, that wouldn't be like honoring God, right? But these honor God. And so I was going to tell you the story. That's Adam and Eve, but they have two kids, Cain and Abel. And Cain doesn't really offer, you know... I know, I just touched one. You touched one? Yeah. And Cain doesn't offer the best stuff. He offers stuff that looks brown and old and wilted and stuff. And, and 
Cain and Abel offers beautiful gifts to God. And God says, thank you for the beautiful gifts. What, what is it? Yeah, that looks like some kind of berry. I bet you the birds would love those, huh? And so when we offer God gifts, we want to offer the best that we can, just like these beautiful flowers. Can you give these? No, I, those are, no, those are for um, up here on the, on the altar for, um, for Mrs. Grace, for the whole church to enjoy. Okay? Yeah, that's, a, that's the book. Yeah, that's my book. Yeah, isn't that nice? Well, we don't have time to read it right now, honey, but, but is, is there Sunday school today? No. Okay. Okay, but maybe some other time we can read about Adam and Eve, okay? Oh, you want to read it now? Okay, but maybe that. Okay. Okay, but thank you for coming up. Okay, thank you for coming up and saying hi. First time, wow. You're a pr yes, you are. Yes, you are. Wow, big day today. All right. So let me just tell you a little story. I used to uh, go to um, the, these youth retreats up at Goshen, Camp Howe, and they had a service dog. And these service dogs are trained to love everybody. No matter what these kids would do to the dog, the dog was supposed to love them. Dog didn't like me. <laughs> so I don't know how these kids would come year after year, month after month, and the dog would get along with everybody who didn't like me. And Sakura will go to anybody. That's the first time Sakura came to sit with me. So I'm really happy that she finally came to sit with me. That meant a lot. So let us now turn to our anthem. And because Anthony's not with us today, not feeling all that good, um, our anthem today is, I got to find, oh, it's not on that one. It's over here. It is Ave Verum by Mozart. now turn to our prayers uh, before we hit the yellow sheet uh, let's just offer some prayers that we've been for a uh, number of months now prayers for Ukraine and the people of Ukraine for peace there we also offer our prayers to those affected by the war between Israel and Hamas and we pray that that does not expand uh, those people do not need any more violence we also continue to pray for our nation as we face the reality of persistent and institutional racism and I'd also offer, like to offer prayers for a friend of mine who passed away this past Friday, uh, Louise Pahalski. And so uh, my prayers are for Louise and that she may rest in peace. Uh, do you have any other prayers, joy, celebrations you'd like to offer before we go to the yellow sheet? Yes. Thank you for your prayers for my husband Greg. He is home from the hospital now, so we can take all the prayers. Thank you. And he was at our breakfast, so he looked really good yesterday. Yeah. Any other prayers? Joys, celebrations? <clears throat> okay, seeing none, let us turn to our yellow sheet and let us offer our prayers for Alan, Alice, Amy, and Tom, 
Angie, Angie, Antonia and family, Art, Bill, Bonnie, Kathy, Chris and family, Cheryl, Cindy, Doreen, Edna, Fred, Grayson, Greg, Jeff, Jim, John, John, Kathy, Lini, Leslie, Liz, Marsha, Mary Jane and Joe, Michelle, Mike, Richard, Rick, Sandra, Sandra and John, Steve, Verna, Virginia and Richard, Wink, victims of violence and natural disasters anywhere in the world, and we pray for peace on earth. And may we now turn inward for just a few moments of silence in the midst of our public worship to offer God those prayers that we just can't say out loud. So just a few moments of silence. God of all times, all places, and all peoples, whom we have glimpsed in creation and the life of the one who shared our common lot, help us to acknowledge Jesus not only with the words that we say, but through the way that we choose to lead our lives. May we come to be so attuned to his word that we hear it not only in church or in the Bible, but in the world and through all the people Jesus loves, which means all of the people. May the excitement of our faith testify to the Spirit's rousing of our souls and to the transformation of our lives and of our congregation and help us to believe by assuring us that our prayers, they are heard and that they do matter. And for all these things we pray in Jesus' name, amen. And may we now come together to share the prayer that Jesus gave to all of us, the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. <laughs> The ways in which we use the wealth entrusted to us, they, they sometimes teach even more than the words we use about our faith. What measures do our offerings send out to the world? Do they communicate our delight in knowing God and trying to follow Jesus as best we can? Do they tell others of our care for the underprivileged and the underserved as Jesus would have us do? What we offer makes a difference in practical ways and also in the spiritual life of the church. Therefore, may our contributions be as generous as our faith expects and as our conditions in life allow. And donations will be accepted now if you so choose. And if you are joining us via Zoom or FCAT, they can always be mailed here to the church. However you choose to give, if you are able to give, it is appreciated.
accept, O Lord, these offerings now to be placed here in your sanctuary as a symbol of our love for you and for all others. In today's gospel, we're going to hear Peter venture an idea of who Jesus is, and it really hits the mark, but then he backtracks and really blows it big time. But that's the message of we don't have to be perfect, because we know that Peter was there at the, at the time of the Last Supper, at the resurrection, at, afterwards. He was there in the Acts of the Apostles. He has two epistles in the New Testament. We know that, G, that Paul, I'm sorry, that Peter remained. And because of that, we don't have to be perfect. We just have to try to continue on this path that leads to a better and better knowledge of who Jesus is. Church is one of the ways that we can stay on that path without giving up every time we hit a brick wall. We're here to help each other find our way around our obstacles and to continue forward. And for all that you do so that this church may be here for all of us, each of us, and even those beyond, thank you and God bless. For all that you do for this church, thank you and God bless. And for all the donations that we have now received today, may God bless these to his continuing work so that we may continue to be the people of God trying to find our best way to Jesus. In his name we pray, amen. And our reflecting hymn this morning is Red Hymn number 351, Nearer My God to Thee.
today's gospel is taken from Mark chapter 8, verses 27 through 38. And Jesus went on with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi. And on the way, Jesus asked his disciples, Who do people say that I am? And they answered him, John the Baptist, others Elijah, and still others, one of the prophets. And Jesus then asked them, But who do you say that I am? And Peter answered him, You are the Messiah. And Jesus sternly ordered them not to tell anyone about him. And then Jesus began to teach them that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed, and after three days rise again. And he said all this quite openly. And Peter took Jesus aside and began to rebuke Jesus. But turning and looking at his disciples, Jesus rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan! For you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. And Jesus called the crowd with his disciples and said to them, If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel, they will save it. For what will it profit them to gain the entire world and then forfeit their life? Indeed, what can they give in return for their life? Those who are ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of them the Son of Man will also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with all of the holy angels. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts together be acceptable to you, O Lord, our Rock and our Redeemer. So this past Tuesday, after we took a little bit of a summer hiatus, um, the clergy in the Hampshire Association got together at the Hadley Church, as we do on the second Tuesday of each month, um, just to get together and, and be with one another. And so as I was walking uh, another pastor, we were walking out and going to our cars parked across the street. As we were going out there, as she got to her car, she realized that she had left her purse inside the now locked church so that when we leave and we close the door, it's automatically locked. And so without her purse, there's no, there's no phone, there's no keys, there's no wallet. She doesn't know what to do. So we're standing there in the, the Hadley Church. I bet you've all seen it. Um, the church is here. There's a little driveway, and then there's Town Hall. And so I thought maybe somebody in Town Hall would have a key to help us get into the church. You know, maybe at some point they needed a, to have some kind of a meeting, needed a larger space or something like that. So, you know, there's a pretty close relationship in a lot of the small towns between the church and the town hall. So I thought maybe they had a key to get them in. So we went over to ask. So the first person we ask, they have no idea. But the first person says, go talk to so-and-so across the hall. We go to so-and-so across the hall. So-and-so doesn't have a key, but so-and-so knows somebody. That person who knows somebody, literally, and that person knows somebody who happens to be the sexton of the church. And then about 10 minutes later, this very nice older gentleman shows up in a pickup truck and says, who's the pastor locked out of the church? And got us into the church. So that's that small town mechanics. You know, no forms to fill out, no, you know, you know, like disclosure saying who you are, you know, sign off on any kind of lawsuits because I called you or anything like that. No bureaucracy. It's just people who know people who know people, and all of a sudden somehow that all comes together and it works. And that's small town mechanics based on knowing people and relationships. And I'd like to take that example from this past Tuesday and apply it to the small town that's around Jesus. So Jesus, we all know, has got his 12 disciples. Those are the closest followers. But there are these others hanger-ons. And they, 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 they kind of follow Jesus a little bit. They kind of listen a little bit. They're, they're intrigued, but they're, they're not like disciples. They're, they're there, but they're not really fully committed. And so you got this whole big group. And to this whole big group, one day, Jesus says to the disciples, who do people say that I am? And, you know, you wonder why Jesus at this point in the gospel is asking that question, you know, who do people say that I am? Why is he asking his closest followers, who do people say that I am? And I think it has to do with the fact that just a little bit earlier, um, in one chapter earlier in the gospel, Jesus has done this miraculous healing or feeding of the thousands of people with just a little bit of food. And so everybody recognizes that there was nothing and then there was more than enough. And you would think as you're reading along that, oh my God, people must have been so impressed with Jesus. They must have given Jesus so much praise. And so your, your ex expectations are here. 
And then all of a sudden, in the Gospel, you read that the people who are opposed to Jesus, they become even more adamantly opposed to Jesus. They don't see Jesus as elevated. Now they're actually insinuating that the power that Jesus has, they don't deny that they just saw this little turned into a lot. They're not denying that, but they're saying that that is not from God, it's from Satan. And so they actually call Jesus not just misguided, but Jesus is evil. And so when that happens, Jesus kind of just gets deflated. Jesus is expecting people to maybe, you know, what do I need to do to reach out to these people? How do, I, how do I convince them that I have this gospel message from God and that this is a better way to lead life? How do I convince them that I am the living word of God? And, and so as he's trying to do this and he keeps meaning defeat after defeat after defeat, even amongst his followers, Jesus at this point in the gospel, this midpoint in the gospel, just kind of loses wind. And it says in the text, that Jesus sighed deeply in his soul. Jesus is exhausted. He's worn out. He doesn't know what to do. And he just breathes deeply. He just sighs and he says, I don't know God. And so he turns to his disciples and he asks them, who do people say that I am? You know that, that small town example about people knowing people, about knowing people and it all kind of fits together? Jesus is asking them, who do the people say that I am? What is their impression of me? If they need something, who do they think I am? And so you get that whole idea about, you know, Jesus needs some help at this point. Jesus is just, he's exhausted. And, you know, we don't always talk about Jesus as exhausted because we always want to think about Jesus as, you know, all-powerful. But at this point, the very human Jesus is exhausted and he doesn't know how to continue. And his disciples, you know, they, they give answers that are expected. You know, um, John the Baptist, maybe Elijah, maybe one of the prophets. These are all good answers, but they're not adequate to explain Jesus. So Jesus is asked a question, but he does not know how his people will answer. You know, I, I've heard that when lawyers ask a question in court, they should really already know the answer they're going to get. If you get a different answer and you're surprised, that's not good for the lawyer. Um, or maybe you, you've heard about these people who propose at like these gigantic stadiums and they got the jumbotron and you know, uh, Jane, will you marry me? And then they, they kind of focus in on this poor guy, you know, holding the ring up. God forbid she, Jane ever says no in front of thousands of people. You know, you should probably have a pretty good idea when you ask the question, will you marry me, that Jane is going to say yes instead of 10,000 people saying, oh my God, I feel so bad for that guy. So when you ask a question, you should know the answer. But Jesus doesn't know the answer here. Who do people say that I am? And so the disciples, again, they offer respectable answers with all their, their three, Elijah, a prophet, John the Baptist, but it's not enough. And so then Jesus, and the way I see it in my, my eye, I hear Jesus asking this question, really hesitating, and almost as a whisper, almost in desperation. And he says, who do you say that I am? to his closest followers. I need to know that somebody knows who I am. Do you get it? Because they have not been getting it. Do you get it? Do you at least understand who I am? Who do you say that I am? And then Peter, as is his custom, he blurts out an answer right away, you are the Messiah. And Jesus, it goes way up here. He says, thank God somebody gets it. And too bad Peter didn't just stop right there. But Peter's got to keep talking. So it comes up to here, you are the Messiah. And all of a sudden, though, Jesus then goes into this talk about who he is as Messiah. I'm going to go to Jerusalem. I'm going to be there rejected by all the religious authorities. They're going to reject me. They're going to crucify me. I'm going to die. I'm going to resurrect. And Peter has the audacity to take Jesus, the one he has just called the Messiah, the one sent from God. Just think about what this says. Jesus, the one I said is sent from God, the Messiah, I, Peter, am going to pull him aside over here so no one else hears, and I am going to yell at Jesus. It says in the Bible, I rebuke Jesus. So he has the audacity to say to Jesus, Jesus, you got it wrong. You're not going to go to Jerusalem and die. You're going to go to Jerusalem as the Messiah. You're going to free us all. You're going to be powerful. You got it wrong, Jesus. And Jesus is over here. He had been just exhausted. He sighs deeply in his soul. Peter kind of lifts him up. And now Peter has just stomped him into the ground. He made a horrible mistake. So Jesus turns away from Peter. This is not just for Peter alone. It says he turns to the disciples and he says about Peter, 
Get behind me, Satan. You won't hear harsher words from the mouth of Jesus than those words. Get behind me, Satan. And he says it to Peter. Get behind me, Satan. He's not even talking to Peter. Peter is here. And he says to the disciples, Get behind me, Satan, for you have set your mind not on heavenly things, but on earthly. And think about where this takes place. Caesarea Philippi. And, you know, if you know towns from the Bible, like Bethlehem, like Nazareth, like, you know, maybe Jerusalem, if you know those towns and they're familiar, try to add Caesarea Philippi to your geography lesson of the Holy Land. Caesarea Philippi is extremely important. It's a turning point in Jesus' ministry. At Caesarea Philippi, Caesar Augustus, the ones that the Romans had called Savior, had called Son of God, all those titles that the church then applies to Jesus after he dies and resurrects, all those things about Caesar Augustus, that Caesar had given this plot of land to King Herod. Herod, in, honor of, in, in reply to that honor, built a shrine there to the Caesar, because the Caesars are divine to the Romans. And so he builds a shrine to Caesar. And then Herod dies. His son Philip takes over. Philip takes the shrine and expands it into this, this really major area, Caesarea Philippi. In Caesarea Philippi, he honors both Caesar and me, Philip. And so you've got this place that is associated with Caesars who are called, you know, Savior, Son of God, these, these people of power and armies and wealth. And then you've got Herod and his, his dynasty with Philip. You've got another story of power and wealth and hereditary, uh, you know, on, passing on these, these honors of kingship. And all of that is the background. And so when, G, when Peter calls Jesus Messiah, that's the Jewish term for power, it just discombobulates Peter. He gets confused with earthly power and the power of Jesus. I'm going to go to Jerusalem. I'm going to die, and I'll die there for you. And he gets it all mixed up, and that's the reason, get behind me, Satan. He doesn't set his mind on God's ways. He sets them on human ways because the Caesarea Philippi is about power. And Peter got it all wrong, and he really got just lambasted by Jesus in the harshest way you'll ever hear in the Bible. But you know what? Jesus, as we go back further into the story, when it's, uh, you know, on uh, Holy Thursday, on Maundy Thursday, when Jesus is there at the Last Supper, all of a sudden, Peter's there. On Easter, Peter's there. The Acts of the Apostles, after the whole resurrection, ascension, and all that, G Peter's there. We have two epistles in the New Testament, Peter's there. So Peter had really run into a brick wall and did not know what to do, did not know who Jesus was. But he stuck with it, I think, because of that community around Jesus. So let's take, let's take leave of the Bible for just a little while and go back to that, that mechanics, the small town mechanics, or back to the idea of small town mechanics where people and people and people, you kind of know people and that's how it all works together. So Peter had run into this wall and he has to rely on other people and Jesus to kind of bring them back to the path. But you have to allow yourself to be brought back to the path. You can't be adamant and stubborn in your opinion. You have to be able to adapt. And so Peter somehow gets back into the story because of this community. And think about yourselves. We belong to a congregational church. It's right there in the name. We believe in the congregation. So we don't have the infallibility of a pope to tell us that this is the way it is, and then you simply listen to the pope. We don't even have the infallibility of the Bible that is uninterpreted. And so you just take this uninterpreted Bible, you plop it down maybe 2,000 years later, and eventually it's going to be 3,000 years later, and you just simply take what was, you don't interpret it, you don't do anything with it, you just say this is the way it is forever and ever, like God never speaks again after 2,000 years ago. And so we don't have the infallibility of an uninterpreted Bible that we just use like it's magic, open it up, and there's the answer. We don't have that infallibility. And we don't have the infallibility of our own individual imaginations about who God is. Because we can get it wrong, like Peter got it wrong. We believe in the power of the congregation, about us coming together, and us sharing our ideas together so that the Holy Spirit speaks to one, the Holy Spirit speaks to another, the Holy Spirit speaks through the word, the Holy Spirit speaks through music, the Holy Spirit speaks through this present, this place. And all of a sudden, somehow, the Holy Spirit takes us all, like that small town where people know people who know people, and all of us come together as the people of the church, and we find our way to God. Because that is the question that Jesus is asking all of us. Who do you say that I am? We can't answer that alone. Jesus didn't offer that question alone over here to Peter. 
He said it to the group. And then he calls the larger group together. Who do you say that I am? That's the congregation. That's the blessing that you're in right now. This is where God, the Holy Spirit, and Jesus come down and somehow bring us together so that my ideas, they don't have to be the infallible ideas just because I'm dressed in a dress up here, because I've got this on, this shawl. No, it's because we all come together, and all together, God can speak to us as a community, as a congregation. And then that congregation has the power to help us go forward to know Jesus better. Not infallibly, because what we say today may be turned around in 500 years. Because we do not speak for all time, we speak for today. Because God never stops speaking. So count this place, this time, these people as a blessing. Never think of this as an obligation. And so as we come together, may Jesus fill our hearts, our souls, and our minds so that when he still says to us today, who do you say that I am? Forever and ever, we'll have a better and better answer. In Jesus' name, we pray for that enlightenment. Amen. And our hymn of closing this morning is Rejoice, the Lord is King. Read hymn number 204. Thank you for coming out on this beautiful Sunday that is, I think, this is our last summer Sunday. I believe when we come next week, we're already into fall. Thank God, I love fall, but this is our last beautiful summer Sunday. Thank you for sharing some of it with us as the church. Um, if you do want to come to Bible study tomorrow, just send me an email and we can do that. Also, there is a conference-wide event. I should have mentioned this earlier. The conference is sponsoring Project Proclaim, uh, and that is to help smaller churches so that we can get better publicity through all of our members, not just uh, through the clergy, uh, but through all of our members. So Project Proclaim is how to get our message out there a little bit better. And uh, the conference comes in, they bring the food, they bring the drink, they bring the presenters, and the only thing that Hatfield has got to do is, is supply a building. And so if you'd like to come, that is next week, uh, 3 o'clock till I think maybe 5. Um, so if you'd like to learn how we can help the church through Project Proclaim, that's at the Hatfield Congregational Church next Sunday, 3 o'clock until 5 o'clock. So thank you very much again. We'll have our benediction, uh, congregational response, and then hopefully we can go on our own separate ways uh, to share the blessing that is this community. May our words and actions this coming week proclaim God's love for all people. May our heart's meditation be acceptable to God. Let us listen for the wisdom that God seeks to share with us and let the counsel God imparts guide our way as we seek to live our faith. Jesus' hand is outstretched to each of us. He calls us to follow where he will lead us. 
So let us be open to the guidance that Jesus offers so that we do not get lost on the road of life. And let us now go forth to love and serve our brothers and sisters out in the world, whoever they may be, wherever they may be from, so that we may continue to build the reign of God on earth. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you.